This podcast is brought to you by Voice and Vision, bringing help, hope, and healing to individuals, families, and communities affected by mental illness, addictions, and disabilities in southeastern Pennsylvania. Financial support for this podcast is provided by a Veterans Trust Fund grant from the Pennsylvania Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Welcome to Untold Valor, a podcast with a unique focus on veterans, featuring stories of courage, recovery, perseverance, and strength. Listen to hear veterans share their perspectives on what it's like to battle mental health challenges, combat addictions, and overcome other adversities unique to those who have served. Hey everybody, welcome into another edition of Untold Valor. So excited to have another great guest here on the program with us. We have the founder and president from Mighty Oaks Foundation and USMC Force Recon veteran Chad M. Robichaud here with us, and he's going to chat with us about his time in the service and his own personal struggles as well as his foundation, Mighty Oaks. So really looking forward to this conversation this week here on the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to us as always. Uh, If you have not done so, you can check out past episodes and future episodes as well as they come out. And, of course, Reverend Ben is here with me as well. Reverend Ben, welcome back. How are you, my friend? I'm doing fantastic. I'm looking forward to another opportunity to learn as much as I can from our guest today, and I'm glad to be here. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Yes, sir. And great guest, as I said. We've got uh, – I don't, I don't have enough time, really, in the podcast to read Chad's bio and all the things that he's accomplished, so we'll get in and just chat with him a little bit. But, sir, welcome in. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you here. So, uh, so you were a USMC Force Recon veteran, uh, MMA champion, best-selling author. I mean, just tons of stuff. So, uh, we can go wherever you'd like to go. But let's get started a little bit with just a little bit about you, uh, your time in the service, and and things of that nature. Yeah, well, well, I actually come from a, a long history of military service. My family's been serving for over eighty years now. Every every war from World War Two, wow. Korea. Uh, my father was our first Marine as a Vietnam veteran. He was uh, he served as a 0311 rifleman in Vietnam. I served as a force recon Marine and did eight deployments to Afghanistan. And both my sons served as Marines. And one of them is an Afghanistan veteran as well. And both of them actually finished their service in the Marine Corps and, and work with me at Mighty Oaks Foundation. So wow. uh, big, big history of military in our family. And, you know, for me, uh, joining at 17 years old in 1993 during a peacetime military, I joined with like a lifelong dream of a uh, of being a uh, recon marine or, or and, and force recon marine. I I uh, spent my teenage years reading stories about recon marines and force recon marines in Vietnam and uh, and had an aspiration to do that. And you know, with my father being a Vietnam veteran, I grew up in a very dysfunctional home. My father never really got well uh, mm. from his time in service. So really joined the Marine Corps for me. I had been living on my own since I was 15, right after um, my brother was was shot and killed and kind of a just childhood trauma and, and hardship. And joining the Marine Corps for me at 17 years old was really just a clean slate at life. And I was just very thankful for that opportunity and always, and always have been. And it really gave me a chance to kind of pave my own, my own way. And uh, I really want to uh, fulfill that childhood commitment of being a recon Marine. I went to infantry school and after infantry school, I had the opportunity to try out uh, and made it my first year into what I believe, you know, lots of great jobs in the military. I believe of all those great jobs, the one that fit me best was being being a reconnaissance Marine. Uh, I loved uh, every aspect of that job, you know, from becoming a combat scuba diver and and uh, military free fall parachutist. I was uh, on a Halo team at Third Force Recon, and I just loved all the different aspects of that job and, uh, and was – kind of chomping at the bit during a peacetime military to actually get to go to war and do it. And unfortunately that came at the cost of a nine 11, you know, mm, I, I was yeah. a sergeant. I remember watching those planes fly war trade center buildings. I was a sergeant at third force recon company. I was a, uh, the military free fall team leader there and just being in that type of job and watching it happen and knowing like, Hey, my life's about to be different. Like the world just changed. And, uh, you know, if any older people, veterans listening and it was around that time, you kind of knew like, you know, we quickly transitioned from this, pretty long period of peacetime, you know, operations to yeah. you know, the nation at war for, you know, I'd say for 20 years in the war on terror, but you know, we're, we're still, and look what's going on. It's you know, still today. going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so yeah. you know, the world definitely changed on September 11th, 2001. And I wanted to deploy and I didn't get to go right away, but uh, during that, you know, previous year after the deployment, I tried out for what's called the JSOC task force. 
Joint Special Operations Command Task Force. And and as a Marine, I was a, allowed to go and represent the Marine Corps at what I believe to be the you know the premier special operations unit in the world. And I uh, was one of the few Marines selected to get to go there and JSOC and and subsequently got to do eight deployments as what's called the AFO. Uh, advanced force operator. I think the best way that people don't know, don't know what AFO is to describe it is like working undercover. Uh, you work in a singleton capacity, teamed up with a local national to go ahead of your unit in, in non permissive areas, mountains of deep in the mountains of Afghanistan, across the border of Pakistan, to really build all the clandestine infrastructure to put your assaulters, assault forces on target to capture or kill bad guys. And at my unit, it was probably whoever was on the top ten list from you know Bin Laden down the no, number that's 10. Amazing. So, uh, so that's, 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 I, uh, and that capacity, I was partnered with a man named disease who was my interpreter, my teammate, and ultimately became my friend. And, you know, Aziz and I did over, over a hundred missions, over eight deployments together, you know, doing those, uh, clandestine logistical operations to put our soldiers on target. And, you know, he saved my life many a times on the battlefield and he's an incredible human being. And, uh, you know, he was my primary teammate and during those deployments were some rough years. And uh, towards the end of our time, we had a, what's called, what could be considered a compromise on our operation. And uh, during that compromise, uh, you know, during my deployments, I lost 15 team members. Uh, but during that compromise, 12 of our team members were were captured, uh, and t- 10 of them were Afghans, two of them were Americans, and they were captured and killed. And uh, and our operation was compromised. We had a V bid driven into my house, vehicle, born improvised explosive device driven, driven in my home. And we, uh, I ended up being abducted by a foreign intelligence agency. I can't say which one. It's actually the Pentagon redacted it in my book, Saving Disease. But if anybody does the math, they could probably figure out which organization had grabbed me. But uh, and I, after that, we had, I actually ended up attempting to operate again. But at that point, my anxiety had got so bad, I was having these debilitating panic attacks and realizing uh, me not wanting to speak about it because of my pride or shame. Um, not wanting to ask for help, I, I realized that I was putting other people in danger. And so when I finally did speak up and say something about it, I was put before a clinical psychologist and I was diagnosed with uh, PTSD, I was read out of my program, I'm not allowed to do my job anymore. By that time, I'd already uh, switched from being active duty to a contractor at my command. So it was pretty easy, like immediate, law, not working anymore uh, for the military. And I spent about three years going down a very dark, deep uh, spiral that led me to you know, dealing with these debilitating panic attacks, anxiety, depression, a separation from my family. And I found myself um, alone in, in a closet in my apartment, my family pictures on the floor and a pistol, you know, deciding that out, wow. you know, maybe my family would be sad without me, but they would be better off. And wow. I had decided to take my life. And you got, I think you guys know in this, on this program that that same hopeless start finds a home in the hearts of over 20 veterans every single day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I had made a decision to take my life. This was over a period of days. Um, the one thing that I knew every time I put that gun to my head was that someone would find me. Mm-hmm. And the only person that had a key to my apartment was my, at the time was my oldest son, Hunter. And the thoughts of my son finding me that way was enough to pump the brakes. But I was in such a dark place and committed to, to do that. And it was one morning I was uh, sitting there in that closet. And I heard a knock on my door and it was it was my wife. Uh, when, I, when I first heard a knock, I wasn't going to answer it. When I heard her announce her voice, I kind of panicked. And I was so angry that she was there. Sounds twisted, but I was so angry that she was there interrupting me, killing myself, uh, that I ran to the door and just started berating her for for being there. My wife, by the way, is not a very calm arguer, but uh, <laughs> in, in that moment, she was she was actually pretty calm. And she asked me a question that radically uh, changed my life and probably saved my life. She asked me, you know, how could you do everything you did in the Marine Corps? We, we were 17 and 18 when we met. So she saw me become a recon Marine schools and trainings and deployment workups as an athlete you, you mentioned me being an mma world champion you know 18 i was 18 and 2 as a professional fighter like you see me you know do these fight camps and cut weight and all this stuff and, and the discipline it takes to do that she's like how could you do all of that and when it comes to your family you'll quit yeah wow and there's no more soul cutting work to me than to be called a quitter but she was absolutely right i've been successful at professional things in the military and in life when it came the most important things like being a husband being a father uh, being a young 17 year old kid that raised his hand on those yellow footprints at you know MCRD San Diego and made a commitment to do something important in my life, I quit in all those things, including my will to live. And uh, in that moment, I p- made a pretty radical decision to get back in the fight, but I didn't know how. And I, I, uh, but the one thing I did know is that I knew I couldn't do it alone, and I knew I couldn't do it with the people I'd surrounded myself by. I'd surrounded myself by people who 
told me everything I want to hear and not what I needed to hear. Mm. And I had this MMA gym with a thousand students in it and all these people that were supporting me as a, as a professional fighter and a jiu-jitsu black belt. And, and, uh, and so I made this radical decision that I'm going to get better. I need help. And my wife was going to this church while we were separated. And I asked her, is there some man at this church you're going to that can help me hold me accountable to this decision? I didn't care about her church. Mm. I just knew I needed someone outside of my circle. And I met a man named Steve Toth. Uh, we met at a Starbucks coffee shop and I'd written a really good plan of how I was going to fix my life, like a five paragraph order. I was super proud of it. And I really wanted him to show it, to show it to him. So he could tell my wife that I was really trying when I slid it over to him, he slid it back to me without even reading it and told me I was going to fail. And I remember being like really offended, like wow. this thing's like super good. And, and uh, but I'll never forget what he did. He tapped on the paper and he said, this plan doesn't have anything to do with your relationship with God. I'm not going to waste your time. I'm not going to let you waste mine. And I, I remember in that, in that moment, like sitting there thinking that I tried everything, right? I've been on all the medication from the VA, different types of pills. And uh, I've been through all kinds of counseling programs, both VA programs and, and civilian programs. I had financial success during my time that three years uh, that's downward spiral because I dove into fighting and I had notoriety. And so some of those things are some good and some of those things are bad, but none of those things changed my situation. And uh, we have a saying at my foundation now, it comes, c- comes out of this moment, right? If what you're doing isn't working, then why not try something different? And everything I tried didn't work. It was time for me to try something different. So I actually kind of blindly trusted this guy, Steve, and I, I made a decision to surrender my life to, to Jesus as a Christian in that moment. And, be, and beyond that decision, Steve discipled me and mentored me, for those that don't understand the word disciple, for a period of a year. And, and it may sound, to people listening, it may sound super simple, but to me, to me, it was profound that through that process of him mentoring me and discipling me, and teaching me uh, these lessons from the Bible, what I discovered is all these bad things that happened to me, Afghanistan, losing buddies, these some horrible things in some of these deployments and seeing some of the things and doing some of the things that uh, did made some of the decisions I made in my childhood, like as bad as all those things were. And I don't only didn't really share much of that with you as bad as those things were though, those things that lead me to be in that closet with a pistol, man, would let me there with the choices that I made in response to those things. Mm. And now he's mentoring me in a different model of making choices, everyday life choices. The Bible gave me a new blueprint for making better choices. Did I still have anxiety? Did I still get depressed? Did I still get angry at times? Of course I did. I've been through some bad things, but now I had a blueprint to make better choices. And I became very intentional about that. And by doing that, I found restoration in my own brokenness. I found restoration in my family. I found hope. Uh, and ultimately what I found was was purpose again. And that purpose eventually manifest itself in a deep burden that I believe God put in my heart to pay those lessons that I learned through that process forward to others. And that led to the founding of Mighty Oaks Foundation just 12 years ago. And uh, in that time, we really do four things at Mighty Oaks in that pay it forward effort. Um, we do resiliency events. I've been able to speak to over half a million active duty troops on bases around the world. I've written a, no- a number of best selling books and uh, I've given away about 400,000 copies to the troops. I, t- I teach at Marine Corps boot camp every quarter uh, for the last 10 years now. And so, you know, speaking to half million tr- troops about sharing these biblical principles about resiliency and the military talks about four pillars of resiliency, mind, body, spirit, and socially being mentally tough, physically tough, socially being with, around the right people, but having a strong spiritual foundation. I get to teach these things now to these active duty troops. And then we have a recovery program. We have five ranches around the country. We spend about $8 million a year running this program. Everything's for free to our troops, including the flights. Uh, for active duty service members, veterans, first responders, spouses, we pay for everything from them to come spend six days with us in our non-clinical faith-based peer-to-peer mentoring program at these ranches, and then tap them in our aftercare program for ongoing aftercare to learn how to make these decisions and then have the support system to live them out every day. Uh, third thing we do is we have an advocacy program where I'm in Washington, D.C., uh, advocating for faith-based veterans care and policy. Uh, uh, during the last administration, President Trump had appointed me to be the chairman of the White House's uh, faith-based coalition for veterans affairs. Um, we got executive order signed and, and policy changed. Uh, and then the fourth thing we do is our international program where we share these uh, successful faith-based principles and programs with our ally partners around the world. And we're all over the world doing this. Uh, I've been to Ukraine 10 times last year. We're training, we're training the chaplains in Ukraine. We just certified 35 new chaplains. We've been all over the front lines of Ukraine, taking Mighty Oaks alumni who have once been broken, uh, found hope again. Uh, through relationship with, with Christ and aligning their lives with the lives they were created to live and going, not just getting well, but going uh, around the world and paying it forward to, you know, in places like Peru and uh, all these places around the world. And uh, sometimes we have another sub organization 
Now, Mighty Oaks doesn't do this, but we started a sub organization that does take some of our special operations veterans who came through Mighty Oaks. And we um, we do re- like, for example, we rescued Benjamin Hall, the Fox News reporter that was catastrophically wounded in Ukraine. Wow. Uh, and then uh, so that's what, you know, for me, like my service and the hardships that I face, being able to turn those around and, uh, and, and pay those forward, build this organization that doesn't just help veterans, but helps veterans get back up and be in a position to lead again, to be in a position to help the next guy. And that's why Mighty Oaks has grown so much in the, in the last 12 years. And uh, I'll say, I'll say one more thing that kind of ties back to the beginning. And then I, I kind of took up all you guys. Oh, no, here. you're fine. You're great. But, uh, my, there's a quote by mother Teresa. She said, um, God will never give you more than you can handle. I just wish you didn't trust me so much. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's kind of been my last few years. As I mentioned in the beginning, Aziz, you know, as I say Aziz saved my life multiple times in combat. He probably saved my life every day. Don't walk there. Don't eat that. Don't talk to that person. You talk right now, they're going to kill you. I mean, think, imagine the job that we did, right? And mm. us being alone together. He had the risk he took just from being with me and doing the work we were doing. Uh, we've been in, you know, we've been in kinetic gunfights and, and uh, together. Uh, there's been several times that we've been just the two of us, you know, in, in bad positions against, you know, multi, you know, numerous Taliban. And he's just an amazing human being. And when we were not out operating in the mountains of Afghanistan or across in Pakistan, I didn't go back. To base and he went home i went to his home like his my first warm meal out of coming to those freezing cold mountains was his wife hotra made it i was there i held his babies mashuda mashuda when they were born he's like family to me and so in 2021 when president biden made the announcement he's gonna do the withdrawal of afghanistan there's a lot of things i was not happy about and we could do a whole episode on uh why that was a terrible decision for the world uh, for america and for afghanistan mm. uh, a lot of those things that you know i couldn't influence but the one thing i could was not could do is not allow my friend to be left there uh, i made a decision to get my friend his wife and his six kids because i owed him that life debt and uh i put i called several friends who are former special operations veterans who put a small team together to go get Aziz, aziz's wife and his six kids and and uh and we made a commitment to do that and and then uh god had bigger plans as we lean forward to make, make this operation happen uh, one of our team members uh, recognized the fact that it was 3,000 orphans that were being abandoned there. And uh, that led us to make a decision that was really just to answer the burden that got put on all our hearts, all our hearts, to help as many Americans, interpreters uh, that were SIVs, w- uh, women, children, Christians, every person, could help as many people as we could. And we leaned forward to that, again, the burden that got put on our heart. And we called it, you know, we Mighty Oak started to save our allies coalition that later that led to nonprofit. We called it Task Force Six Eight from Isaiah Six Eight. Here my send me, and uh, and honestly, we just leaned forward. Uh, we got a lot of credit for it, but the truth is, I'm not smart enough to pull this off without what happened <laughs> off. God just, just orchestrated a miracle uh, by using us being willing, and that led to us rescuing not only Aziz, his wife, and six kids, but seventeen thousand other people, and uh, from Afghanistan during the withdrawal. And it's all it's all cataloged in the book uh, Saving Aziz, which is being made into a film right now, which is a huge honor to be able to. Not for me, but to tell Aziz's story and the story of these amazing individuals that said yes to me, asking them to simply help my friend and what God did with that. Uh, and it's a, it's a story of obedience because, you know, the operation was crazy. It was scary. It was beyond our capability. And God just kept performing miracle after miracle from getting access to HKIA to going to HKIA to getting out access to go outside the wire, rescuing these people to staying after the Abigail blew up to get more people. And, you know, Dennis Price and myself going into Tajikistan and swimming across the Panjshir river uh, for 10 days straight in Afghanistan to build routes for women and children to get out. The whole thing was just nuts uh, to do and be a part of, but to just, I, I just really excited to share the story so the world could see that, you know, when the governments of the world fail, including our own, that good people will stand up and do the right thing in spite of that, and help their neighbor. And yeah. that, and that God still is a God of miracles that could perform just the most amazing things that we're not capable of. We're just willing to be obedient and say yes. And, uh, and, uh, so I'm excited to, that story's getting out and being shared. That's, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm speechless. I talk for a living and, and I'm speechless, just an amazing, an amazing story. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing. And yeah, your uh, the book is saving Aziz. Um, and so just certainly check that out. And I think, I guess I know we were going to be respectful of your time here today, but I want to, I think the thing that I take away from that, that might jump out at me of all these amazing accomplishments on your bio and the stories you've just told and everything that you've gone through and done is that no matter, you know, no matter how successful or, or not, you might have viewed your military career like PTSD, which is one of the things we talk about a lot here on the program is trying to help, uh, 
other service folks who are struggling, it can attack anybody, right? It can happen in any – success has nothing to do with it, I, I suppose, is maybe the takeaway that it kind of hit me with. You can still – struggle and and you still need help right you still need someone to turn to and and obviously you you finally got that yeah you know um one of our tagline sayings at mighty oaks is never fight alone and it's not just a tagline you know i think the reason i ended up in the situation i ended up in is because i tried to do it alone when that anxiety and and panic attacks first hit it 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 first surfaced out of frustration and anger i came home and was just a tyrant to my family to my wife and kids coming home from deployments yelling at them slamming doors, punching holes in the wall, breaking things. My frustration was out of control and I didn't know how to manage it. And so instead of getting well and, and identifying it at that time, I, th- I tried to justify it. I have to be this way right now. I have to be violent, right? This is, I have to be like angry. I'm, I'm supposed to be this way. And, uh, and l- by not dealing with that behavior early on and telling people and asking for help, that anger and t- frustration turned to manifesting these physiological symptoms that I never thought in a million years I would deal with. My arms would go numb. My face would go numb. I'd feel like my throat was swelling shut and I couldn't breathe. I knew this. Uh, I learned these were signs of panic attacks, but I was so ashamed to tell my peers because I thought they would think I was weak that mm. I kept it myself because I would have thought that of them. So my pride and both the anger, frustration, and the manifestations, physiological event, effects that I was having, my pride didn't allow me to get help. And I chose not to get help. And that pushed me to the point to where the wheels completely flew off. And I reached a point of panic attacks to where I would go to the emergency room. My blood pressure is 200 over 130. I felt like I'm thousand percent convinced I'm dying right now. I'm having to tr- take Ativan to tranquilize myself. Uh, I went from being a singleton operator, AFO, at one of the most premier special operations units in the world, trusted with, to where I can't drive to the gas station because I'm so debilitated with fear. So if anybody thinks that can't happen to them, because I wouldn't believe that, you know, we're none of us are beyond, uh, we're, we're human yeah. and we, we sometimes we see or do things, whether in our occupations or just part of the being in a broken world that we were never created to see or do or participate in. And when we do this things, our body has a very natural defense mechanism that God hardwired us to in our limbic system that uh, tries to prevent us from being in danger and, and that, that manifests itself in, in these uh, physiological effects that we don't know how to how to reconcile and uh and you could take as many trust me i've been through all the counseling and all the medication and all that stuff i'm not saying those things are have no place but i believe that ptsd is a spiritual wound and a spiritual wound always requires a spiritual solution and uh and i had tried everything before nothing worked until i made the decision to align my life with the life i was created to live take all those burdens that i was carrying trying to carry on my own that was so ashamed to get help for and put them where they belong in the hands of God and not on my shoulders and, uh, and found relief of that and, uh, and, and found a way forward. And ultimately it did just bring healing for me, but it re it renewed my sense of purpose. And look, I would have never thought when I was going through those moments, I mean, like I said, I was so terrified that sometimes I couldn't even get in the car driving myself at the gas station. Yeah. And I say this completely humbly. I'm not trying to sit here and boast, but for me and Dennis to be by ourselves in Tajikistan, spending 10 days to, within 30 yards of the Taliban, Chinese military, Russians swimming in Afghanistan, doing these operations with a complete peace that I never even had during the height of my career in, in, in JSOC. I never even had that before just because of the peace that uh, we could have through relationship with God to know that nothing on this earth could scare us, not even death because uh, of the, our, our confidence in eternity. Uh, that peace that comes from that is, is so freeing. And I never thought I would have that, but, you know, I have that now. And it's amazing, you know, the military, again, the military teaching these four pillars of resiliency, not even realizing they're, they're naively not even realizing how right they have it. Our military needs to be mentally tough. They have to be motivated and have the right mindset. They have to be physically tough to do their jobs in the military, regardless of what their jobs are. Socially, they have to be surrounded by the right people, right? You can't pick who you work with in the military, yeah. but you could, you could choose who you let speak in your life. But that spiritual foundation, they, they name it. But they seldom are able to identify what it actually means. A spiritual foundation is one of the most unique and powerful ones. And I could tell you that when I went to Afghanistan the first time and, and I thought, you know, I have all those. I had to wear Christian stamp and dog tag, but I can't do that right now because I, I, I can't be a man of faith and be this violent warrior. The two can't coexist. And I deliberately chose to put God out of my life in the early days of Afghanistan and left a giant hole inside of me that filled with hate and rage and anger and bitterness and a darkness took over. It led me down a very dark path. But yet to look back and see people of faith that were in the battlefield of combat and the battlefield of life and some of the strongest men I know. And uh, there's, there's 
something to that, that a lesson that all of us learn. And, you know, I yeah. found that and it's my life mission now to share that with others. Yeah. I mean, Reverend Ben, I know we've, uh, we've just been listening. It's just been an amazing story from Chad, but that's pretty similar to you, right? I mean, you, you took the same thing for you, your faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I can really appreciate what you're saying because, uh, it's like a parallel for myself. For me, it was a spiritual growth and commitment that really brought me out of the darkness into the marvelous light. And also it set me free from self bondage. Yeah. Yeah. Just amazing. And so Chad, I know that we've, you know, I've been just hearing this amazing story. I want to talk a little quick, real quickly, if we can about Mighty Oaks. So is that it's mightyoaksprograms.org. Uh, a lot of great information there. Uh, just we always do the message on here if if veterans are struggling, like you know, and they need some help and resources, like the folks here that put on this podcast at at Voice and Vision, uh, as well as yourself. What's that message that you would share, and or that you would like to kind of convey to other veterans who might be sitting there going, "Yeah, I, I don't know how to ask for help, or my pride's in the way, or whatever the case might be." Yeah, I go back to never fight alone statement that I made earlier. You don't have to fight alone. Like you weren't created to fight alone. You may feel alone and isolated, but you're not. There's so many, you know, Mighty Oaks is one. There's so many amazing people in this country that care about you, regardless of your story, regardless, even if you were discharged dishonorably from the military, I can tell you, we don't care about that. We care that you raise your hand to serve and we are here to serve you. And, uh, and you know, the problems that you're facing, you feel like you don't have an answer for, you're not supposed to have all the answers yourself. Uh, that's why God puts us in a community and, uh, you know, there are people here to help you. And I mean, we're an easy solution to not, to not being ashamed or embarrassed because you can, you know, discreetly go on our website, you know, mightyoaksprograms.org, click the apply button, fill out about five minutes of information. One of our staff team members will contact you back. And, uh, whether you're an active duty, a veteran, first responder or a spouse and, and, and no, there's zero excuses because there's no strings attached. We'll pay for your flight. We'll pay for your training. We'll get you out there. It's about $3,500 to get someone through. So if anybody's listening and wants to donate, then you can donate because it's not free for us. But we do about $8 million a year in programming. And, uh, and you know, we've never had to turn anyone away. And and we've had over 5,000 graduates from our program. And uh, and we deal with a lot of people that are dealing with suicide, the suicide epidemic. We've, we've lost four people out of those 5,000 over 12 years. But while those four people are important and, and it's very tragic that we lost them as graduates, that I'll take those stats uh, any day over um, the stats of clinical uh, clinical solutions. And yeah. again, I'm not saying this clinical solutions is not a place for them, but it doesn't have to be either or, right? You could uh, yeah. you could do both. Yeah. And uh, you know, I believe that uh, again, as as people who are created, we have to have a relationship with the Creator in order to get past the hardships of life. And and we have an amazing group of uh, of alumni that teach there who are not, you know, consoles are great, but it's so much different when you're sitting across from a team of people and a class of peers who are going through the same things or have been through the same things and maybe just a step further than you and figuring out the right direction to go and doing it together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Chad, for being here. Thank you for taking the time out to, to visit with us on here on Untold Valor and sharing your story. And again, we'll have the links up for folks to check out in the show notes as well. Uh, but uh, any you know departing message you'd like to share before we go? I, I think the last departing message I'll give is a, uh, if you're a veteran, veteran, first responder, or, you know, or in the military, you're one of only half a percent of this country that serves. Uh, if you raised your hand at some point, regardless of where your job was, you're a leader for doing that. You have a heart to serve. Your mission is not over when you take that uniform off. Your purpose is not over when you take that uniform off. This world, and especially this country right now, as broken as it is, needs warriors, needs leaders to stand well, up. Yeah. And who better than the people from the military? If you're knocked down right now, then if not getting up back up for your own sake, get back up for the sake of others and lead again. And, and, and uh, we could help you do that. Well, so. well said. Thank you so much for being here, Chad. Again, founder and president at Mighty Oaks Foundation, USMC, Force Recon veteran, Medal of Valor recipient, best-selling author, pro MMA champion, and just a fantastic guest and, and a fantastic person. Thanks, Chad, for being here, taking time out to talk with us here on Untold Valor. Thank you guys so much. God bless bless you as well. Reverend Ben, thanks for being here, my friend. For Reverend Ben, for Chad, I'm Mark Kelly, your host, and we'll see you next time here on Untold Valor. You've been listening to Untold Valor by Voice and Vision. We hope you found the information and resources discussed today helpful. As always, thank you for listening and for your support. 
Remember to stay connected with us through our various social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Don't forget to visit the website, voiceandvisioninc.org. That's voiceandvisioninc.org, where you can sign up for our blog and find free resources and information on upcoming events, webinars, workshops, and get support. You can also access our free help and hope guide for individuals and families struggling with substance use and addiction. If someone you know is struggling, please reach out for help because you and your life matter. Remember, the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is available to you at any time by dialing 988. We are all ambassadors of hope and recovery. And if you want to share your story, please contact us. Compeer Corps is also looking for veteran mentor volunteers and veteran participants. To find out more information about Compeer Corps, please call 610-541-0790. That's 610-541-0790. You can find all the links and contact information for the resources mentioned on today's episode by checking the description and the show notes section of your app. Thank you again for tuning in and for your support. Until next time, this has been Untold Valor.